he started at the University of California and didn't stay a full semester. And he was virtually self-taught. You know, he loved literature and, and um, he was very interested in psychology and science and you name it. So he really gave himself a pretty good education, which stood him in good stead, I think, later on. And uh, in any case, whatever happened, uh, he dropped out of, of the university. So here he was on his own, living in his own apartment by this time, in the middle of a university setting with um, university kids coming by all the time, like myself, uh, to the music store. And um, that was our major connection initially, was through the music. He would recommend things that he thought I would like to hear. And uh, it, was, it was a very musical courtship. They had listening booths, which were very private. And we had musical discussions, actually musical discussions often. But at any rate, it was the music that drew us together. Um, after about a year and a half, we got married. And uh, that's substantially how we got together. On June 14th, 1950, Philip K. Dick married Cleo, his second wife and together they lived in a modest house at 1126 Francisco Street. It was at this time that Philip decided to become a professional writer. His wife was very supportive, and his marriage created a perfect working environment. He felt that somebody would buy his stuff. He knew the magazines very well, and uh, he knew he was writing very well, and um, we both knew that he would be published at some point. And Phil, at that time, he wrote a lot of short stories, one right after the other, real fast. And they all sold because they were pretty good. Some of them, the very first story he, saw, he wrote in the science fiction style, sold. Anthony Boucher was the editor of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And he had been publishing stories for years. And um, Philip sent him some stuff, and he was very encouraging, and in fact bought the first story, the story that they called uh, Friday Morning, which was originally called Rook. Spiffer was an Australian Shepherd, um, probably at least eight or nine years old, and you know, black and white, beautiful dog. And the dog, would run across here. So in Philip's story, um, there was a dog very much like Spiffer who realized that what people called garbage men were actually rugs, R-O-O-G, and that's what he was calling. He wasn't just barking. See, he was saying, rug, rug. So, so, and he tries to protect the family from the rugs. Uh, he doesn't know if the rugs intend to eat everybody or if they are only eating the garbage. All he knows is they're taking the garbage away and storing it somewhere. Uh, and that's Spiffer's story. Wonderful dog. Gosh. I would say that the main theme in Phil's fantasy writing is the uncertainty of reality. That's something he comes back to time and again. There are people who believe one thing is true and it turns out not to be true. And that occurrence, that discovery, usually an unpleasant discovery of, of the reality being other than we think it is, that is the big fat thread that all of the other threads are attached to, I think. What's real? And what is unreal is the basis, of course, of Philip's stuff, and is the basis, I think, of any decent fiction writer's stuff. One thing that puzzled Phil Dick throughout his life, he never quite trusted reality. He was never sure this table was going to be a table in the next minute. And he was also a pioneer in having a deep skepticism about the nature of reality. And that's the aspect of Dick's work that I think makes him seem so peculiarly contemporary. 
How do I know that my internal view of reality is real? Then you have a Philip kind of situation. There are many realities, maybe. Or are, you, are we like flies and we see with a lot of different lenses? Maybe it's all the same thing we're seeing and maybe it isn't. You know, maybe there are as many realities as lenses in a fly's eye. He had a rather complex psychological life. He had numerous nervous breakdowns, whatever that means. He went to see a psychiatrist as a teenager. He had various phobias, uh, agoraphobia, eating phobias, and so forth. And um, he also himself felt and worked out in his fiction uh, a profound sense that the boundary between his inside psychological life and the exterior world was not altogether clear-cut and unambiguous. That that boundary was a shifting boundary and to some extent maybe even indeterminate. And then the hallucination, if it was that, happened. He saw the personal manager in a new light. The man was dead. He saw through the man's skin his skeleton. It had been wired together, the bones connected with fine copper wire. The man's voice issued from a tape, through an amplifier and a speaker system. That was when panic overtook him. One of the most stunning days in our lives at that time was Philip sent out stories all the time to all kinds of magazines, not only science fiction, but all over. And they'd come back, you know, and we'd send them out again. The post office is right down the street. And uh, one day there were 17 manuscripts returned in the mailbox, in and around the mailbox. And it was a, a real blow. So we solved it by picking them all up, marking which ones had gone to what, place, you know, and when they'd been returned, and just, you know, we put them in new envelopes and sent them all out again. That was hard. That was hard. They were poor. Phil was very poor for most of his life. The, uh, it, was, it was funny. At one point, I think it was when he was married to Cleo, he was so poor that he couldn't afford human food. He had to go to a pet store and buy what was it called? Happy dog, dog food. They had a capital P in front of the word poor. I think that Philip always had a feeling, unfounded, I believe, that he might never be able to live off his writing. When he started to sell stuff, it was, of course, wonderful. But the early stories, he got, I believe, as little as $80 for one. Not very much money to appear in some of these uh, magazines. And uh, he, his agent told him that uh, he wasn't ever going to make any money, how, no matter how many short stories he sold. He should write novels. So Phil obediently got started writing novels. In the back of Phil's head, was the idea that this was just a stepping stone to becoming a great novelist in the general sense of the word, known to the general public, because he was known uh, a lot by science fiction fandom. In 1955, Philip K. Dick's first novel, Solar Lottery, was published. The city of Berkeley was thriving with student demonstrations and the politically left-wing ideas of Marxism and communism. Although Dick tried to distance himself from these more radical political views, the atmosphere contributed to his already existing paranoid tendencies. Phil had